So we have arrived, dear friends, to part two of this retrospective review of the Madoka Magica series. This time we'll be talking about the film sequel to the original television series, Rebellion. If you've stumbled upon this video without seeing part one, I highly recommend watching that first to catch up on everything we've discussed thus far. And of course, given that this video is entirely about Rebellion, the entire movie will be completely spoiled here, so if you haven't seen it yet, now would definitely be the time to do so. Did you see it? Well then, I imagine you might have a few questions, such as, Who is this chick? What's wrong with your face? What just happened? Yeah, when I said at the end of part one that this sequel was one of the most polarizing sequels in modern anime history, I was not fooling around. In fact, I struggle to think of any similar anime film more divisive to its fans, aside from the end of Evangelion from nearly two decades prior. There has been a lot of uproar over this movie since its initial release, and more often than not, the discourse surrounding it will fall into one of two emphatic camps. People who love it, and people who loathe it. Many will argue that it flies in the face of many of the themes and messages emphasized by the original. Some still will praise its extension of the show's themes into darker and more thematically troubling places. Suffice it to say, the talks get complicated. And what better way to approach a complicated film than by talking about it for a long time on a YouTube video essay? Well, actually I'm sure there are better ways, but whatever. That's what we're going to be doing today. In this, the final part of our retrospective analysis on the Madoka series, let's talk Rebellion. Our story begins with the anime television series, which had a special announcement in November of 2011 in the December issue of Katakawa Shoten's New Type magazine. Reports spoke of a three-part theatrical film project for the series being put into development by Shaft. The first film, Puella Magi Madoka Magica Part 1 Beginnings, would cover the first eight episodes of the original anime series in recap film fashion, with upgraded animation, re-recorded dialogue, and further visual upgrades to the existing material, and would release in Japanese theaters on October 6, 2012. The second film, Puella Magi Madoka Magica Part 2, Eternal, would cover the final four episodes of the original series with similar upgrades, releasing in Japanese theaters on October 13th of 2012, only a week after the first part. The films were screened at select locations around the United States and other countries between October of 2012 and February of 2013. I actually got to see them in a theater back then. But that still leaves us with the third film promised, but still up in the air. Fans would be excited to see a tease of what was to come after the credits rolled on the second film. The short snippet provided a glimpse at what the sequel would be about, and the hype was palpable. Finally, after many months of waiting, as well as an ever-excitement-stirring ad campaign, Puella Magi Madoka Magica Rebellion would release in Japanese theaters on October 26, 2013, with North American screenings taking place in December of the same year. I also saw that one in theaters myself. The response was interesting. Rebellion was nominated for multiple awards, and true, most professional anime outlets gave it favorable praise, particularly for its gorgeous visuals and creativity, but characterized the story's last-minute twists as mean-spirited and, quote, ludicrously out of character. Fan reactions were even more extreme, ranging from wholehearted embrace of the movie's plot and others entirely denouncing it as impossible to reconcile with canon. Death of the author and all that. Despite this polarizing response, however, Rebellion still manages to remain one of the most discussed anime films of the past near decade, and there's plenty of reasons to talk about it, too. To outline what we'll be going over today, I'm going to give sort of a brief rundown of what you can expect us to be tackling as we go. First, I'll be taking a general look at the plot in sequence, in sort of a short order summary fashion. This will give us a chance to lay out the basic plot beats for convenience's sake, and generally set the stage. Second, we'll be talking about some of the internal character logic, most notably the characterization of Akemi Homura, which is no doubt one of the most heated topics of Rebellion discourse. I'll be attempting to go more into Homura's portrayal over the course of the series as a whole here too, and how that ties into her characterization and ultimate turn in Rebellion's final scene. Third, we'll be talking about theming, literary references, visual cues, and so on. This will dive further into other characterizations as well, and will probably be the broadest topic on the table for this video. Forgive me if it gets a bit wild as a result. 
And finally, we'll be attempting to broadly discuss the film's intent, what it was trying to say and do, and how that intention and messaging complements or contrasts that of the original series, and to what ends or purposes. Before we start from the top, let me also emphasize very clearly here, at the beginning, this is just my analysis, my subjective opinion, my reading of the text therein. I do not claim to be an expert, I don't claim to know every detail of the creator's intent, and above all, I do not in any way claim to be an authority on this topic. If your opinions or views on any of the following differ from my own, I'm not calling you wrong, just stating how I see things. Okay? Cool. Okay, let's continue. The story begins oddly in the midst of a seemingly carefree Mitakihara city, wherein Homura transfers into school and joins Maruka, Sayaka, Mami, and Kyoko along with a familiar named Bebe as they become magical girls fighting against creatures called nightmares. From the beginning, this already sets us up to be thrown for a loop. The status quo at the end of the series demanded that Homura be the only person familiar with Maruka and that she not physically exist anymore in their reality. Meanwhile, Mami and Kyoko were shown alive, but Sayaka was presumed to have already been taken by the Law of Cycles, and we certainly don't know where this little gremlin came from. Furthermore, the creatures they're fighting are called Nightmares, which noticeably differs from the creatures Kyube calls Wraiths at the end of the series. The seeds of intrigue are planted subtly within our minds as we question the validity of everything we're seeing from the very beginning. This is intentional. Over time, Homura realizes that something is amiss in everyone's memories and decides to test her theory by asking Kyoko to take her on a bus to her home city in Kazumino, which neighbors Mitakihara. After multiple attempts to reach it, the girls find their efforts frustrated at every turn, mysteriously leading them back to the station they started from repeatedly. This experiment leads Homura to conclude to herself that the entire Mitakihara city they inhabit is some kind of illusionary world inside the barrier of a witch, which, as you might recall, should be impossible considering Madoka's wish was to eliminate all witches before they are born. This leads Homura to interrogate the one true outlier she can think of, Bebe, who strongly resembles the witch Charlotte who killed Mami in the original series. Bebe seems to know nothing, but Homura continues to try and squeeze information out of her until she's stopped by an attack from Mami. Mami and Homura have an intense fight with each other where neither is willing to concede to the other's viewpoint, which ends with Homura being rescued by Sayaka, who pierces a fire extinguisher to provide cover, similarly to how she provides cover for Madoka to escape from Homura in episode 1 of the original series. Sayaka reveals to Homura that she possesses her memories from the previous timelines, along with a controllable manifestation of her former witch form, and warns Homura to reconsider uncovering the truth. Saying that the world they're in isn't so bad the way it is, Homura, determined still to find out what's going on, realizes the very fact that Sayaka is here and remembers Madoka herself doesn't add up and she goes to meet with the version of Madoka in this world. While talking with Madoka, Homura expresses her frustration and sadness of having to live somewhere she felt like Madoka did not exist in, where she was far away. Madoka, thinking Homura to be speaking of a dream and furthermore unsure what Homura exactly means by far away, assumes this to be far less severe than is let on, and reassures Homura that she would never do something that meant she had to leave her friends behind. This is the tipping point. This is where everything goes wrong, because with that assumption planted, Homura now believes Madoka's sacrifice was unwilling, not born from her selflessness and love for the world, but from obligation and fear. With this new perspective of Madoka's intentions in mind, Homura feels as though she's had an epiphany about everything, and realizes that she is the witch that created this barrier to begin with. She has her suspicions proven when the so far silent Kyube confirms that he and his fellow incubators had masterminded the situation Homura finds herself in. He explains that after hearing Homura speak of a reality predating the Law of Cycles with a much more efficient witch system of gathering energy, they decided to perform experiments to see if they could observe the Law of Cycles itself. The Law of Cycles, as you might recall, is what everyone post-Universe White calls Maruka Kaname, knowing her only as a concept, not as a person. The Law of Cycles dictates that a witch be destroyed before they're born. Ergo, any time a magical girl is on the brink of despair, Madoka will appear to them and dissipate their grief, bringing them to basically what is magical girl heaven. 
The incubator, seeing Homer's despair, had almost reached its apex due to her general loneliness and encroaching self-doubt of her own memories of Madoka, create an isolation field around her nearly entirely corrupted soul gem with the purpose of drawing the Law of Cycles into it, isolating it in the fake world where its memories, including that of its duty and reason for coming, would be wiped, and then observing it. The ultimate purpose of which, Kyubei reveals, is to eventually learn to control Madoka so that the incubators can revert back to the old ways of the witch system because of its efficiency, ironically prompted entirely by the fact that Homura told them it existed in the first place. Truth be told, though, they probably would have thought to do something like this eventually without her help, considering how analytically cold they tend to be. Regardless, Kyubei's plainly stated intentions are enough to provoke Homura into completing her transformation into the witch, Homolily, with her familiars killing every incubator within the labyrinth. Homura decides that the best way to save Madoka, the one thing she's lived her entire life for at this point, is to allow herself to be destroyed rather than saved. But Sayaka and Nagisa, the human form of Bebe, update the others on the situation, revealing themselves to be Madoka's guardians entrusted with the duty of returning her power and memories to her when the time was right. The gang fight through Homolily's familiars to save Homura from herself, before she and Madoka destroy the barrier separating Homura's real body from the outside world. Madoka recovers her memories and powers, and begins to cleanse Homura of her curses, to be brought into the Law of Cycles. And this, my friends is where things get controversial. Homura grabs Madoka, revealing the nature of her curse is no longer despair, but a single-minded and obsessed love. She proceeds to use her overwhelming power born from her overflown soul gem to rend Madoka away from her divinity, transcend into a demon, and rewrite reality once more. The world is entirely encased within Homura's new barrier, and the incubators held at Homura's mercy are forced to consume the collective misery and grief of magical girls across time as a replacement for Madoka. Homura revels in her new world, accepting that she may become Madoka's enemy should she ever remember her godlike powers and oppose her. A post credit scene shows Homura seated in a chair over a half-shadowed Mitakihara below a half-moon. She dances with her new crown-like soul gem while a beaten and scarred Kyubei lays in the nearby field, eyes foggy like that of something rotting. She ends her dance by perching atop the very edge of the cliff, swaying from the light side of the moon to the dark and falling, thus ending Puella Magi Madoka Magica Rebellion. So, uh, whew, yeah. You doing okay? You need to take a break? Get a snack? I wouldn't blame you. It's a lot, and it's only gonna get a lot er from here on. So, like, buckle up. We're about to comb through this sucker. So, Akemi Homura, what is there to say about her? She's obviously a very complicated character. So complicated, in fact, that she tricked a lot of people into thinking that this little stunt she pulled wasn't in character for her. But hold the phone, I can hear you protest. Surely the same girl who fought tooth and nail solely to save the girl that she loved wouldn't do something as dastardly as this. And to that I say, you fool, you poor naive creature. She tricked you too. And well, I don't blame you. First off, let's start by laying down a base assumption most people will have going in. Homura is a sympathetic character. Her struggle is basically what makes up a majority of the plot and conflict in the original series. And though she comes across as cold and difficult to pin down when she's first introduced to us, over time, especially after episode 10, we start retroactively to realize what her true feelings are and what they've always been. This is a girl who started off severely anxious to interact with anyone socially, a girl who had basically no friends, a long-standing heart condition that kept her out of school and in the hospital regularly, who clearly had a romantic interest in other girls, and, oh, yeah, was also raised Catholic. In Japan. Couple that with a clear sense of self-loathing and suicidal ideation, and you have a recipe for a person who has absolutely no self-worth whatsoever. And this is no more perfectly embodied than by how she emotionally attaches to Madoka. Madoka, in the original timeline, is the person who saves Homura along with Mami from being attacked by a witch. She introduces Homura to the world of magical girls. She's nice to Homura. She always wants to be around and support her. But Homura, an ordinary girl living a normal life alongside her new friend, would come to realize soon that not all would continue the way she hoped. 
while Pergishnacht was too strong for Madoka, and she died in battle. Homura, grief-stricken and without the one friend she ever had in life, decides to put her soul on the line for one desperate wish to Kyubei. This wish would change the course of her life forever, and it's worth looking into the exact way she phrases this wish, too. Trust me, it may seem like a small detail, but it's actually very important. Instead of simply wishing to bring Madoka back to life or something similarly, Homura wishes to redo her meeting with Madoka, and instead becomes strong enough to protect her instead of the other way around. A role reversal, in other words. Now, while this would still prove to be a process of trial and error for Homura, who had to go quite the rabbit hole down to go from who she started as to who she was in the beginning of the series, this change of tone is ever so slightly noticeable right from the very get-go when comparing Madoka of Timeline 1, the original, and that of Madoka from every other subsequent iteration of herself. Which is to say, Madoka becomes more and more docile the further you go. And this is not an accident. Though it may not have been a conscious choice or thought of Homura's at the time, it's difficult to deny that by going back over and over and trying to drive a wedge between Madoka and her magical girl lifestyle earlier and earlier, that Homura's goal to save Madoka comes at the cost of disempowering her, and especially putting her on a pedestal. Homura's increasing distrust of the other magical girls who won't listen to her warnings and their ability to hamper her goal sours her opinion of them and thereby regulate them further and further to the sidelines of her priorities, in case you might have thought their shorter and shorter shelf life in subsequent timelines seemed suspect. Madoka becoming the entire purpose for her existence. This fixation proves not only to be to the detriment and dismissal of other girls besides Madoka, but even Madoka herself, whose desires and opinions are often completely thrown to the side by Homura in an attempt to keep her out of conflict and away from danger. And though you could definitely see the goodness in her intentions, it's hard to argue that Homura doesn't come off as a bit obsessive at this point. <laughs> to the detriment of herself and those around her. Still though, this all comes from a place we can understand and sympathize with, and though flawed, we can at least appreciate what Homura is trying to do for someone she clearly loves very much. That is, of course, until we see the sheer depths of how this love has changed her when we reach Rebellion. Something of minor note that might have bore little mention when the series was the only existing material was Homura's reaction to Madoka's sacrifice. Despite seeming to acknowledge it and carry Madoka's memory with her, her reaction never portrays any real acceptance of it. Even in the last moments she shares with Madoka, her protests make it clear that she would rather do without this turn of events, even if it meant the salvation of all magical girls, because she doesn't want to be left without Madoka. This paints Madoka in the light of an ultimate act of selflessness, while it further emphasizes the skew of selfish nature that has driven a lot of Homura's more questionable decisions up until this point. Before we get to how the movie covers this relationship, though, let's explore what Homura's barrier, familiars, and imagery say about her in relation to her state of mind and what's going on here. We already know that for this barrier to exist in the first place, the isolation field was placed around Homura's soul gem by the incubators. They say that it was placed directly before she would have turned into a witch, where the Law of Cycles would usually come down. This means Homura's despair is literally at its breaking point, which she admits that she reached due to not being able to see Madoka, and beginning to distrust her own memories of Madoka. Stick a pin in that one for later, by the way. It's gonna come back up. So, okay, we know Homura's despair is at maximum capacity, Full glass of despair here. So what does that say about the state that she's in? Well, we know that a fully grown witch is a mess of psychological turmoil burdened by the pains that brought it to despair in the first place, surrounded by visions and visuals of mockery that relate to their pain. Not only that, but a witch is also aggressive, hostile, and completely unable to consider reason most of the time. Considering that Homer's soul gem is contained in this state, it's no stretch to imagine that this energy has overflowed well past the necessary point for a witch transformation, but is simply being painfully constrained within this exceedingly tainted soul gem. Let's get a little weirder in our deep dive now. Let's talk about lizards! 
Lizards and salamanders are actually often used in symbology related to Homura during the movie, and this is no coincidence. The salamander is often used to symbolize the flames, which it passes through, a symbol of fire, burning desire and temptation. It was considered a king of fire, and as such represented Christ, who would baptize with the flames of the Holy Spirit. Christ has himself been called the Salamander King of Fire because he passed through the flames of hell after his crucifixion without any harm. Homer's name can be translated as Flame, which is the same in the case of Lucifer. Uh, witches were, of course, commonly burned on the stake. There are plenty of fires going around in fake Mitakihara. This same symbology can also represent a basilisk, a serpent's egg warmed by a chicken, resulting in a creature with bird traits, but often as a deadly monster that exudes poison. Uh, Homura's contained and corrupted soul gem was watched over by a goddess, Madoka, but gave birth to the demon form of Homura, as wings. A basilisk is known as the king of serpents, and once Homura completes her transformation, a classically depicted basilisk is shown again with feathery wings but no crown the crown being on the bottom of her new crown-shaped soul gem. The dress that she wears also shows a broken heart right down the middle, calling back rather plainly to her heart condition. Speaking of that crown-shaped soul gem, it's specifically a king's crown, as portrayed in chess symbols. The ordinary soul gem could resemble a pawn if you squint a bit, too. It's befitting of someone taking up her role, especially when you consider that the new universe had no Madoka for Homura to save, but she remained a magical girl all the same because her powers came from the old world. She didn't get to make a wish in this universe, technically, and her magical potential carried just as much karmic buildup as Madoka's had. Ergo, her soul gem turns into a crown, conquering Kyubei because she grants her own wish. But for all of the powerful potential Homura holds, the visions that surround her as part of her unrelenting psychological distress say a lot more about her than she would like to think of. The falling Madoka in her despair sequence splatters against the ground and these strange towering clones of herself look onward at Homura, judging her for not being able to save Madoka from sacrificing herself. These effigies of a herself that can never be returned to are accusing her the way she accuses herself. The scene in which Homura is angry that the barrier has effectively nullified the intent of Madoka's sacrifice has the Clara dolls, her familiars, shouting, Gott ist tot, German for God is dead. The full quote, God is dead and we have killed him, yet his shadow still looms, refers to the idea that humans took God's power through science to fulfill his purpose, but had nothing left to fill the void with, which draws some interesting comparisons to Madoka's divine purpose and the way it was taken from her by the science of the incubator's isolation field. And finally, I'd like to bring attention to the nature of Homura's witch form, as displayed in her despair sequence. Homolili is led on an endless funeral procession, walking on and on, being mocked and disdained by everyone she passes. Her hands are shackled, but part of her drags behind. What else do we see? Representing some dwindling human emotions of Homura's, by the way. A lizard. Yeah. Furthermore, the Clara dolls themselves, who are Homolili's familiars, play the role of mourners for this execution sequence. Remember, Homura is an orphan, she has no friends aside from the magical girls, and even then, probably only actively considers Madoka to be an actual friend. And Madoka has been whisked out of her world entirely through a sacrifice Homura has begun to convince herself was unwilling. Knowing that she will die alone and nobody will mourn for her, the Clara dolls take up the illusionary role of someone to feel sad for her. And even then, they don't really fulfill their purpose. Their tears are fake, and they permanently wear slasher smiles every time they're on screen. And in the new world, their eternal profession seems to be mocking Homura and throwing tomatoes at her. Truly, there is no stronger feeling inside of Akemi Homura than self-loathing, and that makes her brand of single-minded love very dangerous. It doesn't stop with her witch sequence either as the scene with herself and Sayaka talking in the new world goes to show. In the background, her familiars are not only pelting her with tomatoes, but just before that, we can see some of them jumping off of a ledge with empty shoes on it. In Japan, this is a very potent metaphor for suicide, and suggests that Homura really is just putting on another act, while continuing to reside in her own self-inflicted hell. 
All of this revealing imagery combined with her tendency to disregard others for the sake of Madoka and even Madoka herself for the sake of Madoka, it's really no wonder that after reaching the peak of despair she took such drastic action. After all, when she said this was an action born out of love, she wasn't lying. It may be a twisted and toxic version of love, but it is love nonetheless. Although, that isn't to say her move had no kind of wider significance than simple selfish desire, even if that was the seemingly main driver behind it. Let's remember that although Homura is a deeply disturbed person, she's still been trying to save someone this whole time, and that must indicate some shred of decency deep, deep down, even if it's been heavily obscured by this point. So what are we left to gather from her decision? Recall the Incubator's plan as divulged earlier in the film. They wanted to isolate Homura's soul gem to create a barrier that the incubators could observe, which would then draw in and contain the law of cycles to prove whether or not an entity called Madoka Kaname really exists. They admit just as easily though that this is not simply an act of curiosity and that they plan to observe Madoka for the purpose of manipulating her in the future, eventually bringing the world back to the witch system, a more efficient means of gathering energy while ethically much crueler effectively rendering Madoka's wish and subsequent sacrifice completely worthless. Knowing that this is their plan, Homura decides to complete her transformation and condemn herself to suffer endlessly for the sake of preventing Kyubei from getting his hands on Madoka. But this attempt is foiled when the remainder of the quintet give chase to save her from her witch form. The concern and love they feel for their friend ultimately proves to be their unknowing downfall though as Homura has lost her faith. Given that her last attempt at keeping Madoka out of harm's way has yet again failed, when all else has fallen short and she is given the choice to ascend with Madoka into heaven, she realizes that the incubators could just as easily repeat this whole mess over again with another magical girl, and the express purpose of luring Madoka in is what they're going to be operating from, and she knows it will work because of how Madoka's powers work as a law of the universe. There's a scene I want to call some attention back to from the original series here, which is a discussion that takes place between Madoka and her mother Junko. This conversation in episode 6 of the anime concerns Madoka's desire to help Sayaka but not knowing how to go about it. The advice her mother gives her is that doing the right thing isn't always going to create a happy ending, and that the only way Madoka may be able to help is to make a mistake for her. She warns Madoka simultaneously that though it may be effective, it typically won't end in a neat and tidy fashion, and that her friend may misunderstand her intentions, or even come to disdain her for it due to this misunderstanding. While this particular instance would lead to the subsequent discovery of the Soul Gem's true nature for Madoka and company, this same sentiment when taken away from the specific context and applied to another has some pretty solid ties. See where I'm going with this? Though Homura's intentions were most certainly paved from the same toxic origin of selfishness within herself, they were also motivated by something else at the same time. This single-minded desire to protect Madoka despite even her own wishes or interests manifests into the wickedly duplicitous heel turn that Homura pulls at the film's end. But this heel turn, you could argue, is necessitated by what may happen as a result if Homura doesn't do anything. Why risk it, right? The incubators have consistently proven untrustworthy and willing to lie by omission, manipulate information, and generally be terrible to get their way, and Homura knows that they don't intend to stop their little experiments with just her. As far as she knows, it could only be a matter of time before this happens again, and Madoka isn't lucky enough to escape manipulation that time, leading to not only Madoka being exploited and used, but her wish being snuffed out and the suffering she fought so hard to end being reinstated without mercy. A complete net loss, a checkmate. So before Kyubei can get the drop on them, she makes a mistake for Madoka. A big mistake that could easily be misunderstood, and no doubt will come nowhere close to ending in a neat and tidy fashion. Remember how I said before that Homura is putting on an act in her new world, but that her psyche still betrays the image that she's putting on? This is why. She has become the devil, the antithesis to Madoka, 
possibly her greatest enemy, and shouldered all of the personal responsibility and burden of every selfish thing she has ever done for the sake of making sure that Madoka will be safe. And even now, she knows that Madoka may come to despise her, and she seems at peace with that possibility. The world may be her oyster, but considering a witch's barrier is influenced by their emotions, I don't expect hers to remain stable for very long. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'll move on now. I just had a lot of ground to cover, okay? It wasn't out of character. It wasn't. I'm sorry. It's sad to say, but it's true. She has no friends, she's depressed, and she's gay. More than enough material to build a breakdown around, okay? Moving right along. Let's focus more on symbolism and junk now, which I promise I'll try to keep at a reasonable length, but can't guarantee it will actually turn out that way. Have you checked how long this video has been going already? Let's start with a couple of fun facts that sort of wouldn't fit anywhere else. At the end of the film, when Madoka is positioned as the transfer student in Homura's place, she says that she's been living in America for about three years. The series began in early January of 2011, with Rebellion premiering in theaters in late October of 2013, a little less than three years later. Additionally, in the original series, Madoka's worst subject was English, perhaps a little leg up on the learning curve from Homura there. Chiwa Saito, the Japanese voice actress for Homura, recorded two separate takes for Homura, starting from where she captures Madoka. The second take is the one that ended up being used in the final film, with the unused first take being much different in tone and lending the ending an overall much eerier feel. In this take, Homura sounds much more overtly evil, unhinged, and even as if she's filled with some perverse ecstasy. Saito was unhappy with the take when she finished recording it, saying it didn't fit Homura's character to turn her into a full-fledged, irredeemable yandere, which resulted in the second take. <laughs> This might shed some further light on the intentions of Homer's character and how far in one direction they were willing to tilt. <clears throat> Remember Faust, by the way? Oh, yeah, you might have just said to yourself, that thing that hasn't come back up yet. Well, it's about to. In a 1979 essay written by Faust's author Goethe, he claimed that three emotions were necessary to tragedy. Fear, pity, and terror. In tragedy, there is also meant to be sacrifice for the sake of catharsis, which reflects very well upon the ending of the initial series. Madoka's ascension reflects that of Gretchen in the Cathedral from the end of Faust Part 1. This catharsis reconciles the character of Gretchen, but notably does not close the book on Faust himself. Still saddled by the burden of selling his soul, among other things, this is where we're gonna start talking about part two, and you'll have to forgive me if it's a bit disjointed, because Faust part two is infamously difficult in terms of its structure, and grafting it completely on top of Madoka Magica would be an exercise in self-torture. And I've watched The Future Diary. We'll also be taking a look at Milton's Paradise Lost, which sort of gets tossed up in the mix here. Now, recall one of the most important qualities of Faust I discussed in part one, that being his representation of humanity and their ability to grow and change from a place of inherent flaw, but still the desire to do better. Homer's struggle throughout the original series and the quandary surrounding the morality of her choices is a good fit for Faust to begin with, made even stronger by the connection of her contract with Cube and Faust's pact with Mephistopheles. Part two of Faust is described by Alfred Holzel as showing, quote, a promising climb which relapses at a crucial moment. This is the perfect framework from which we can explore Homer's character journey, which leads us to Paradise Lost, where the character of Lucifer is portrayed as well aligned, not to be confused with Dante's Satan, which is a very different story, and he's also deeply feeling but also cunning and malleable, and at times he comes close to being sympathetic, despite being self-absorbed and arrogant. As put by Paolucci, perhaps the most important and moving quality of Milton's Satan is his appreciation of all that is good and beautiful. He is painfully sensitive to light and love. His despair is awakened sharply at the sight of heaven and Eden. He cannot help remembering the goodness of God. He yearns to ask forgiveness, but dreads the shame he would suffer among those he seduced to his purpose and for whom he has assumed full responsibility. 
Like Milton's Lucifer, Homura does obviously yearn for redemption, but will and cannot ever repent. She would become a witch for Madoka. She would destroy the whole rotten world for Madoka. She would kill Madoka in timeline after timeline after timeline, as many times as it took to save her. She's driven by a humanitarian impulse, but to the darkest of extents. It's just like she says to Madoka during her despair sequence, no burden was too much to shoulder. I could bear any sin as long as it meant being beside you. Homura has achieved climactic consummation of the roles of both Faust and Satan, even taking on an aesthetic duality to Madoka herself, as well as their opposing purposes. The nature of selfishness versus selflessness, law over love, order over chaos. In this way, Madoka and Homura have become the truest and most self-evident embodiments of the very equilibrium their story was built upon. But like, there's also a lot of the nutcracker in here. We gotta talk about that too, it's kind of important. While Faust was the biggest cultural influence on Madoka for sure, and shaped the way its universe conducted itself from the beginning, the crux of its aesthetical inspirations definitely shift in the direction of Prussian author E.T.A. Hoffman's explosive 1816 story when it comes to discussing this particular installment. Let's talk about why that is. The most obvious example can be drawn from Homo Lily, the witch form of Homura herself. Her title is, what else? The Nutcracker Witch. The official description of her first form reads as follows. Its nature is self-sufficiency. Its gallant form, which once split many nuts, is now useless. Without any other purpose, this witch's last wish is her own execution. However, a mere decapitation will not clear away the witch's sins. This foolish witch will forever remain in this realm, repeating the procession to her own execution. I want to particularly point to this line right here. Its gallant form which once split many nuts is now useless. In the original Nutcracker story, the Nutcracker is a figure crafted by the godfather of the children of the Stalbum house, Drosselmeyer. Marie, being especially fond of it, is told that while the figure belongs to the mall, she can be his special caretaker. The children pass the Nutcracker amongst themselves to use it to crack nuts until Fritz tries to crack one that is too large. The Nutcracker's jaw breaks, and Marie, upset, takes him away and bandages him with one of the ribbons from her dress. Now, while one could point out Madoka's bequeathing of ribbons to Homura as a parallel to be considered, I want to focus on the one that's more on the nose. Namely, that Homolily, as depicted, is clearly missing some face space, and has a bandaging to show for it. Very similar to this part of the story. The story goes on to describe how the Nutcracker, who comes alive in Marie's fantasies, battles a mouse king for her sake, and eventually Marie remarks that she would never behave as the cruel princess who rejected the Nutcracker did, and would love him in spite of his looks. This breaks the curse on him, which makes him human again, and he asks her to marry him, which she accepts, and he whisks her away to the Doll Kingdom. Now, barring the more obvious parallels, like the Mouse King to Kyube and the repeated Nutcracker imagery throughout the film, there are more subtle references to be noted. You might have noticed that the Nutcracker as a story has some kind of uncomfortable implications, and this parallel is taken to a creative new level of self-awareness when its depiction in Rebellion is brought about. What can get tricky about this, though, is the analogous qualities of certain characters to certain other characters. While Homa Lily is called the Nutcracker Witch, and Homura herself even acts as a Nutcracker for her own soul gem late in the film, it's hard to deny that Madoka shares some parallels with the titular soldier as well. In this case, Marie would obviously have her role filled by Homura, which works well as a parallel when you consider how Marie only sees the Nutcracker come alive when she fell asleep, Madoka's presence in Homura's barrier world and her family forbids her of speaking of her dreams, similarly to how the other magical girls don't remember who Homura is, and she vows to love even an ugly nutcracker, similarly to how Homura promises to always be with Madoka no matter what. But of course, this line of comparison is not perfect, and gets more tenuous as it goes, with the much more obvious Homura as the nutcracker analogy working in a far closer and more sinister way the further it goes. Perhaps another role reversal has occurred here. Remember that at the end of the story, Marie leaves from her real life forever to live married to the Nutcracker in the Doll Kingdom. Marie therefore exists only as somewhat of a ghost of a character, 
only really being meant to take care of her imaginary prince, vanished, disempowered, and subjugated to a kingdom ruled by dolls. The world Homura creates, in this case. It's a pretty apt but frankly chilling comparison to be made, emphasized by the lingering aesthetical influences of the story proper throughout the rest of the film, ranging from the more obvious to the more subtle. For example, when Mami is confronting Homura over Bebe, the TV behind Homura shows teeth falling from the upper jaw of a mouth. This mouth obviously belongs to the Nutcracker Witch, but also draws some similarities yet again to the scene of the Nutcracker having his jaw broken, and other characters who attempt to break a nut for the princess having their teeth fall out as a result. Recall too that the nightmares the quintet faces early in the film seem to be this dream world's equivalent of witches. And now, think about what teeth falling out is commonly associated with. Yep, teeth falling out is one of the most common type of nightmares, arising from many different reasons, up to and including anxiety, low self-esteem, fear of major changes, and broken promises, all of which apply pretty well to Homura. I've had several of those dreams myself, they're horrifying. Homolily's lack of an upper jaw with her teeth serving as mounts for the Clara dolls also means she can't perform her sole function as a nutcracker, similarly to how Homura, no matter how hard she tries, cannot save Madoka, what she believes to be her sole reason for existing. So, okay, let's wrap this all up. We've talked a lot about stuff from this movie, and considering how dense it is, trust me, we could go on. But considering how long we've already gone on, and how comprehensively I think we've managed to cover most of the important ground here, we're gonna start pulling this picture together. What is Rebellion for? What's it trying to say? Does it work compatibly with the original series and its themes? Well, that's going to be a complicated question to answer. Yes, even after all of this expositing. Let's put it this way. If the series of Madoka was the catharsis, the allegory, the statement, Rebellion is what we're left with when Faust is the one left behind. Part two, so to speak. Ultimately, there's still a tragedy at play that hasn't ended yet, and it's a great deal more personal than the esoteric workings of a metaphor. While our emotional takeaways from the conclusion of the series gave us a broader lens with which to view things in the world, Rebellion asks us to turn inward and consider the enormity of what those principles may mean or not mean to an individual. Rebellion is less a story about people and more a story about a person. And with individuals comes emotion, experiences, viewpoints, biases, misgivings. Homura is a deeply tragic character with many redeeming and sympathetic qualities, who is undeniably driven by a selfish love that only grows more unstable as the days pass. While the series of Madoka gave us a conclusion befitting of Madoka herself and her own ideals, Rebellion came around to pick up the slack, which was the level of ambiguity still surrounding Akemi Homura herself, to depict that ambiguity honestly and not try to dance around it. And though that may have ended up leading to a much more dour result, I don't necessarily think it invalidates what Madoka said to begin with. Like I said before, this is much more of a personal narrative than the last, and it takes a markedly different approach because of that. It still has things to say, depressing though they may be, but I wouldn't argue that these personal developments in the tragedy of Homer's choices necessarily reflect a reversal on theming. Of course, I think a lot of the flack of this variety that Rebellion gets presupposes that Rebellion is the end of the series, which we know is simply not the case. While very little has come in terms of the main story since the concept trailer released shortly after Rebellion, which I'll note seems to take similar inspirations aesthetically from Swan Lake of all things, we have plenty of evidence to support Rebellion being a piece of bridge media, from the simple fact that it doesn't really end very conclusively to the fact that Shaft still seems to have grander plans for the world and characters, both implied by their trailer and the various hooks that they leave out in the open during the film's finale. We're left to assume that Rebellion acts not as any kind of new conclusion to what once was, but instead an olive branch, a character study, which will set us on the path for a bigger, more insane finale than we probably could have ever imagined. But hey, don't just take my word for it, take Shaft's word for it. I'm not just talking about the recently airing spin-off anime based on the Magia record mobile game, either. In 2019, at a convention appearance, Chiwa Saito stated, 
So, how should I say this? Madoka Magica, the actual series, has not ended yet, so Homura will definitely come back again. Furthermore, in a pamphlet about the history of anime in the Heisei era published by MBS, Shaft president Mitsutoshi Kubota said of Madoka, We are now currently in pre-production for a Madoka sequel. Please look forward to it. This was in 2019 as well. Given that Magia Record is a spin-off and Kubota very deliberately uses the word sequel, this all but confirms that this project is the proper Rebellion follow-up we've been waiting for. And given that Shaft's schedule is looking pretty open to it, this checks out. Shaft's biggest property besides Madoka, Monogatari, is coming to an end after 10 years, and March Comes In Like a Lion hasn't announced plans for a third season quite yet. Shaft's schedule, barring the last few episodes of Magia Record, looks pretty bare as a result, which means there's plenty of production time being freed up for a Shinbo-led Madoka sequel coming right around the corner. And if you need even more conspiratorial evidence, let's take a look back at the last two tracks of Rebellion's soundtrack and their titles. The track right before the credits roll is track 44, titled Happy Ending, with the post credit scene with Homura and Kyubei, track 45, being titled Not Yet. This curtain hasn't closed so soon. We've got things to see in the future. I hope this doesn't seem like a cop-out, but in terms of the overall series narrative, we're going to have to put a thumbtack in Rebellion for now, as there's no real way to tell how it will fall into the grander scheme of the story going forward. But what I do know is that it's an amazingly raw and interpersonal character examination of one of the most tragically complicated characters in anime history, and it's well worth your time, just as much as the original series is. If not for the deep dive into Homer as character, then at least for the breathtaking visuals and scoring alone. Seriously, this movie is gorgeous. But I think I've blabbed my mouth off quite enough for one day. If I'm not careful, I may become the next Nutcracker Witch because my jaw is about to fall right off its hinges. It actually hurts, I'm not even lying. That being said, I hope you enjoyed this exploration of Magical Girl Hell with me and found it to be an insightful companion piece to your Madoka experience. Make sure to leave a like and a comment if you want to help me out. It really helps more than you can imagine. And a subscribe never hurt if you enjoyed what you saw here and you want to see more like it. I also, of course, have a Patreon for generous watchers who want to contribute to the growth of the channel and get some perks for their trouble. And with all of that being said, I'm Nesmi VA, and I'll... What was... What was it? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, God. It's happening again!